Hello and welcome. Today we have an eminent personality all the way from Switzerland. He is the first Swiss astronaut. Please welcome Claude Nicolet. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, you have been involved in flying all your life. You first you were an Air Force pilot, then a test pilot, also a commercial pilot, and of course you've gone to space. Sir, I wanted to know what is about the aerial terrain uh, which intrigues you so much that you have invested all your life uh, flying and exploring about it. Well, you know, if um, you have passion for something, you don't really know why it is coming. Uh, I was, since I was a, a young boy, I was always interested in astronomy on one hand. I like to look at stars with a little telescope and take pictures of stars. And I had passion for aviation also. And um, I was fortunate because in Switzerland, uh, I could be at the same time an astronomer after studies in physics and astrophysics. Astrophysics. And I could be an Air Force pilot also because Air Force pilot is an activity which is part time. So every two months I was going to fly with my squadron, uh, six weeks per year total, but the rest of the time I was a, I was a scientist. So I had these two interests in aviation and uh, astronomy and I worked in both areas. And in 1975, uh, I was uh, 31 years of, old, of age and uh, it became possible for Europeans to become astronauts. Until that time, it was only uh, people from Soviet Union or United States, but uh, from 1975 on, it became possible for Europeans. So immediately I said, I want to do that. And I applied for the first selection of European astronaut. Yes, sir. Uh, by the way, Mr. Claude was among the first members uh, elected for going to spa uh, the space program by ESA. Uh, yes, sir. The European Space Association. Sir, uh, can you talk a little bit about that ESA? Because our viewers would be interested to know. Because over 30 years, how it has evolved. Uh, it was in July 1978. You have seen it grow. Uh, evolve over the years? Well, ESA is a very, very successful organization. The idea was uh, in Europe to have, to join the forces, the, the talents and the industrial cap capability and the money of uh, many uh, countries in Europe instead of having separate uh, organizations. And uh, when I was uh, accepted as an astronaut in 1978, there were 11 member states. Now we have 21. So nearly double the number of member states. It's pretty much like a the European Union has been growing, although it's not exactly the same as EU. Switzerland is not a member of the European Union, but it is a member of ESA, even a founding member of ESA. So the idea was really to do uh, space, um, space research and space exploration and use the space capabilities for communication, navigation and uh, Earth observation at the level of a continent, which is Europe, instead of individual countries. It's been very successful. Sir, over half a century after we have landed on the moon, do you think the space programs today are more uh, oriented uh, from the practical applications point of view or for the enrichment of the human knowledge, uh, the, in the excitement of space itself? Well, I think they are both, and both are necessary. You know, I mentioned um, communication, precise navigation with the GPS and Galileo. TED Talk, I watched that, sir. And uh, Earth observation. And in fact, India has been focusing on the utilization of space. Yes. But uh, space exploration, whether it's with robots or with uh, spacecraft visiting the solar system uh, or with human uh, spacecraft, this is very, very lively today also. So I think both areas are very active right now. And I think this is right. You don't want to only use space for practical application but you don't also want to only do space exploration. You want to do both, and we do both now. Giving something back to the people, that's what science should be about. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as you said, as a child, you'd always been fascinated by space and what lies beyond. And I'm sure you've spent many a sleepless night watching the starry skies. Sir, did it ever occur to you in your childhood that in only 20 more years, someone, a person would land on moon? Did you ever think of that? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, the, the, the Apollo program was a very um, goal-oriented program for uh, a demonstration by the U.S. of the... Driven by the space race. Uh, yeah, it was, it, was, it was driven more by political reasons. Of course, there were a lot of uh, very positive uh, technical implications and scientific, but the main motivation of Apollo was to beat uh, the Soviet Union. <laughs> Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, Yuri Gagin, he was never, I think, he was never given as much credit as uh, because he was the first person in space, but the Soviets were never uh, 
Apollo 11 was the star at yeah. that time. And then Swid, uh, you were the first Swiss astronaut soon after that. And today, uh, the space programs has become an international agenda. Even the Asian countries now, India itself, we launched Mangalyaan last year, a very a project which each Indian is proud of. So have you, uh, can you talk about that? So have you heard of Mangalyaan? Uh, yes, I have. Chandrayaan, uh, 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 Mangalayan, yes. I think the Indian uh, have been very successful in space utilization first, because that was the first objective, but then also in the uh, scientific aspect of space exploration to the moon and then uh, uh, <clears throat> and then to Mars. Uh, I'm very I'm very impressed with the achievement of the Indians in that area. And uh, I know there has been some cooperation with Europe and the United States in these. I think there will be more and more. There should be. It should be a, a global agenda rather than a... It's, it's going to be. Because it's something, uh, the one thing that... Uh, binds in humanity together is our curiosity to expand our frontiers and horizons. Well, I agree. And uh, if you compare the evolution from the Cold War in the 50s and 60s between Soviet Union and the United States to where we are now with the International Space Station with 15 countries cooperating, I think the, the, the trend is absolutely clear. And I know that someday this will include uh, China and India also. There's no doubt about that. So, sir, uh, what are your thoughts about science fiction? I mean, uh, I mean, uh, most children today. I mean, the trend has changed. Uh, earlier, only a few section of the a small section of the society was interested in space exploration and remembering the names of the planet. Uh, but today, science fiction has played a huge role in expanding that segment to the common people. So, sir, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, is science fiction not also not polluting? Well, you know, science fiction, by definition, they want to go beyond science, uh, by definition. So I think there has been a lot of uh, science fiction uh, um, stories that are, I wouldn't say credible, because if they are too credible, it's not science fiction anymore. Uh, I think it's, it's, very, it's very healthy to stretch the mind of, uh, of, of people and show them things that uh, seem impossible now, but uh, you just create them by fiction, whether it's by a book or a movie. Um, I think it's very healthy. For me, I had a huge inspiration by 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, this is science fiction, obviously, uh, with the interaction of uh, extraterrestrial through these monoliths uh, around the Earth and on the Moon and around Jupiter, and I thought it was a fascinating story. So science fiction can be, very, can be a source of inspiration. It has been for me, for sure. So we should continue. Yes, sir. Okay, so you have been to the Hubble Space Telescope and we've all, uh, I think we all have seen the beautiful pictures it has clicked over the years. So I was just wondering, how big is the Hubble Space Telescope? It's big. It's really big. I remember when we were approaching with the shuttle, this was in uh, December 93 for the first visit to Hubble. Uh, during the preceding hours, we could see it as a star becoming brighter and brighter and then we became very close. And uh, I was impressed of the, of the size. And in fact, it had been launched three and a half years earlier in 1990 from the cargo bay of the space shuttle, which is about 15 meters long and four and a half meters in diameter. So it's, it's a pretty, really big object. And um, you realize this when you come close and uh, you see it. And we were flying formation in a very precise relative position at 28,000 kilometers an hour, both of us. Um, in order for me, that was my one of my responsibilities to to grab it with a robot arm, and then put it put in the payload bay. So I remember that first uh, encounter with Hubble. I was impressed with the uh, with the size. Yes, sir. So other than that, I was just wondering. I've read it somewhere. There are various tethering protocols for the astronaut. Sir, uh, I just wanted to know what happens if, uh, <laughs> say, one of those tethering protocols fail. Is the astronaut completely lost into oblivion, or are there some other... What do you mean, if we are completely lost? I mean, so there are various stretching protocols, no, to hold the astronaut into space, uh, to hold him into the... Oh, the protocol for the tethering, yes. Well, this is something that we know that it may save our life, so we do it very, very carefully. Um, you always, when you are spacewalking, of course you are floating free, but you always try to hold the structure. Uh, and uh, in addition, you, ha you have your safety tether so that if at some point, because sometimes you need to move, and at some point you may not be able to grab the handhold, in this case you'll float free, 
at least with the safety tether, you can come back to the, to the spaceship. Now, uh, if the safety tether is not properly attached and you continue floating free, with the shuttle, we had the possibility of uh, being rescued by the shuttle. The shuttle would have gone to, to rescue us because the idea was we were always two uh, crew members outside with a spacesuit. The spacewalks were always done with two people. And if somebody floats free, we figure out that it's going to be only one of the two. And the other is remaining in the attached to the structure. And the idea would have been uh, to go with the space shuttle toward the free-floating astronaut. And the one who was still attached to the structure would have grabbed him, attached a new safety tether, and then could have rescued him this way. Now, in the International Space Station, it's different. Uh, space Station cannot translate. You know, it moves on its orbit. It can uh, rotate around the center of mass, but it cannot translate. So what the astronauts uh, have, they have safety tethers, yes, but in addition, they have a backpack with thrust thrusters. So in case they float free because they released the structure and they did not attach their safety tether, they can come back by themselves to the space station because space station cannot go and get them unlike the shuttle, so they need to go back to the station. It's pretty exciting, sir. Sir, uh, tell me about this. What does it feel like to be in zero gravity? Like, is it scary? Is it exciting? Are you questioning your existential? Is it an existential crisis? <laughs> well, I would say that it's uh, exciting for sure. Uh, it's not really scary, but you need to be really careful. Uh, not only for yourself, but for all the equipment that you have with you. The tools, for instance, we had a lot of power tools. The power tools allow us to undo the bolts and to tighten them very rapidly, unlike when you have a manual tool. And it's also much easier if you have a power tool. But all these tools have to be attached with tethers also. And you have to be attached yourself. So it's not scary, but you need to be really careful about what you do. You need to always hold the structure or have your feet attached to a... Uh, foot restraint, as we called it. Um, and then, whatever you do, you have to think all the directions are equivalent, unlike here, where the direction, the bottom direction, is a, is a very specific direction. If I have this glass, and I'm not going to do it, but if I let it go, it goes to the center of the Earth. In space, of course, in space, the water would not stay in the glass, but things go in any direction. So you need to be always aware of that when you are spacewalking. Um, you need to be very focused and concentrated and uh, you need to train a lot because you have normally six, seven, eight hours maximum to do a certain task and you want to really reach the objective during these six, seven or eight hours. Maximum is about eight and a half hours. When I went spacewalking in, um, in December 99, my second visit to Hubble, the spacewalk lasted eight minutes eight hours and ten minutes, so it was a pretty long one. You get pretty tired, and uh, although you are tired at the end of a long spacewalk, you need to continue being very focused, because it's very unforgiving. You cannot make too many mistakes. So, to summarize, it's really exciting, but you need to be careful. Sir, uh, anything more you'd like to say to our viewers, to the engineering students in our college? Um, you know, there are many aspects of a uh, human space exploration that are extremely positive. Uh, one of the very positive aspects is that it has really been bringing nations and uh, people together. Uh, the fact that we have now International Space Station with 15 uh, countries cooperating, including the United States and Russia, which from a political point of view don't agree because of Ukraine and a lot of other reasons. But in space, they still work together. And I think... Um, this is a wonderful example of a one area of human activity and human knowledge where people work together uh, without, any, any, without any big problem, really. Uh, sometimes there are very small friction, but they get eliminated immediately. So I think it's a wonderful example of a, an activity where people and nations work together, and I hope it will continue in the future. And, um, of course, space is, a, is an incredible environment. Uh, the perception you have of the Earth, of the stars, uh, is really, really wonderful. Uh, planet Earth is a, is a beautiful planet, but it's a fragile planet, and we need to be sure we take care of it uh, so that our descendants have uh, at least as good a planet as we have, if not better. Uh, so it's a responsibility we have. Of course, when we go into space, we do a lot of activity related to the Earth. 
a lot of Earth observation uh, in different wavelengths. And uh, I think the future of planet Earth depends very much on uh, how we use space uh, directed toward uh, our planet. So at the same time, we discover a lot of things that are outside of the Earth, but we also focus our attention to planet Earth because we need to, uh, to preserve it for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Mr. Claude Nicolet. Uh, thank you, sir, for being with us today.